All right, we are back live here. It is Tuesday, Tuesday, June 9th. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm Mike Jeffers, Chicago Jazz Magazine, chicagojazz.com. And of course, you are watching Chicago Music Revealed. Whew. We just had a false alarm. So for those of you that saw the false alarm, I apologize. I don't know what happened. The whole system froze up, shut down right at the last second. But we are back. We are live here. We are doing the early show today. It is 545. So I'm only 15 minutes late compared to what I said I was going to be at 530. But it's music and we all improvise. And that's what we're doing here. Anyways, before I get into the whole thing, thank you for joining us. Of course, all the past issues, at sh all the past episodes are at chicagomusicrevealed.com. I'm Mike Jeffers, as I said before. I'm also the Director of Programming and Entertainment at the soon-to-be-opening Epiphany Center for the Arts. Get all the information at epiphanyshy.com. Now, I don't want to delay anymore because I have two separate sets of guests. My first guests, guests... Michelle and Darren, they're going to join us. I'm going to bring them on now. They are doing an incredibly exciting live stream tonight of a show that they had live at Winters, actually, when there were audiences allowed to see live performances back, oh, so many, so many months ago. Isn't it, guys? Isn't that right, guys? How are you? <laughs> we're doing great. How are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm doing much better now that my system's working and I can see and hear you both. So that's, <laughs> I'm ahead of the game so far here today. Yes. Fingers are crossed. But you guys have a great live stream now. I know before we get into the live stream that you're going to be doing sure. tonight, which is your Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross show that you did at Winters. It was about a year ago, I think you said. Yeah, um, yeah. So this is the live stream and you've got some special guests that you're going to be doing and all that. But before we even get into that, I want to make sure that we plug. You guys also do some interesting live streaming on your own, on your channels. So I would suggest everyone checking out where can everybody see the show tonight and where can everybody see your other live stream events where's everything where should we send everybody over to michelle's sure. page yeah um so this will be a facebook live event at michellethomasmusic.com so if you join my page like my page um you'll get alerts when we are putting on live stream shows and um well that, that was michelle thomas music yes and that's also the facebook uh well you can go by michelle thomas or michelle thomas music yeah on uh, facebook if you're trying to get dialed in for tonight so. yeah well we'll we'll link it we'll link it all up and link everything. it in good and but this is the first time you guys pro, mike i know <laughs> but this is the first time you guys are doing something like this because this is a, a actual past performance that you guys recorded when you performed it live at winters mm -hmm. uh one of our favorite clubs obviously and this was back about a year ago and talk a little bit about the show. Actually, Michelle, didn't I have you on my Talk and Jazz show? I think we were promoting it back when you were, yeah. you and Jeff, I think we had yeah. on. Yeah. That's right. And we were actually at Johnny O's, the good old days when all of us could get together and actually be in the same spot during performance. But talk a little bit about the performance. Now, Han Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross, I'm saying it slow so I don't screw it up. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a that, that that's a world famous legendary trio and you guys put something on very special talk a little bit about the performance yes oh uh, no absolutely we this was actually um the second show we had done with a uh, theme more uh geared towards lambert hendrix and ross the group we did a show prior to that the year before too long after john hendrix had actually passed away and i wanted to put together a show dedicating uh, it to the music of John Hendrix with all the lyrics that he had written for so many jazz greats. Um, and so uh, me, uh, Jeff Hedberg, and Alyssa Allgood came together and we basically presented a lot of the solo work. And then we did a couple of tunes from um, Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross, because as you know, um, they're a really iconic group, but it's super challenging material. Um, they were the first to to kind of like be the springboard of what whoever whoever was coming after that in terms of uh, vocal groups, the Manhattan Transfer, Take Six. Um, and so, um, and they were doing music of uh, big bands, of, of, of quartets, and doing these really complex tight harmonies. So um, the next year, uh, Scott Stegman from um, Winters asked us to come back and actually do a show of Lambert Henderson Ross, Ross exclusively. And we took the challenge. 
and <laughs> and did our best to recreate much of their material um, with the three of us who have never sung in vocal groups before. <laughs> I should say never, but we, we've not come together as a jazz vocal group. Right. So I just want to make a note of that. <laughs> well, and I can remember when I had you and Jeff on the show and you guys were talking about that and what what how challenging the music was to put together. And I think, uh, I don't know, you probably knew, but I think Jeff was a little stunned at how challenging it was. And then piecing it all together and putting this show together, it was quite an undertaking, right? Yeah, um, because much of that music, I mean, I would say maybe a portion of uh, the things that um, Lambert Hendricks and Ross has been transcribed, but really not the majority of their body of work. So we were spending a lot of time transcribing harmonies, listening a lot to their past recordings and, and really piecing together the best we could. Like this is what they laid out in terms of harmonies for these songs. Re relying on your chart writer a, a whole lot, uh, you know, just Absolutely. to help out. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I wonder who the chart writer was. Was the chart, is the chart writer around that we could talk no, to? No, you know what? Yeah, no, well, we were going to have him over, but you know, with the, you know, we're still, you know, we're still, it's not quite yet. I know it's stage three, but we're, you know, so. stage four is for chart writers. <laughs> Yeah, phase four. Phase three, you can have outdoor patio seating. Phase four, yeah, the chart writers can be in the same room as, a, right. as the Italians. Right. Is that how it works? So get ready. Stage five, <laughs> Rangers, you might actually start working again. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, so talk a little bit about the challenge of that, though. I mean, you know, putting together these charts, you're transcribing that because a lot of this stuff is not readily available, right? I mean, you, exactly. to talk about the chart writing, I mean, a lot of this stuff is not readily available. And for those of you that are casual music fans and you're watching this, you're like, well, what's a chart writer anyways? What's he doing? Well, he's kind of important because he's laying out all of the music so that the entire band can see what they're supposed to be playing right. and also working through the chord changes. I mean, how difficult was that? Because, uh, you know, you can't just walk up to, well, I don't know, you walk up anywhere and buy music anymore. You can't go online really and download charts mm -hmm. for this kind of music. No, um, and, and so much, I think, of just, jazz genres like you'll find that it's been recorded these things have been recorded but not made into like published music per se so um, or if it is it's someone who's i mean they're watering it down for right. a, for a publication for a school or you know or, or they're expanding it for a, a vocal jazz group but actually finding actual you know there there isn't a an omni book uh for yeah. uh you know uh, Lambert Hendricks and Ross. So yeah, it was... and that that's aligned to the actual arrangements of those original recordings. So that was the other part too. We wanted to stay true to those, like as close as we could to the original arrangements. And so um, just with the help, everybody in the pool, really, Alyssa, Jeff, Darren, all of us were in in terms of trying to piece this together and putting together music um, for vocalists to be able to see here's our parts, here's what we're singing, here's the form and arrangement of this particular uh, track that they did. Talk, talk a little bit. Um, well, Darren, talk a little bit about uh, playing because you, you're also the drummer outside of the chart writer. Right. Um, <laughs> talk a little bit about uh, just putting the band together for this because, you know, we're both drummers. I mean, it's not like you and I sit around and play a lot of this kind. I mean, some of these tunes, yes, but some of them, no. I mean, what, right. what, what was it to put these the, the rhythm section together to make it that cohesive while all this other stuff is happening above it? Well, I think I think the the the, the key was to finding uh, team players is overused, but I guess uh, not so much in the sense of you know they have to lay back and and kind of but like we were rehearsing this stuff very quickly. So if all of a sudden there was a hole that we couldn't fill, it was like you want to take this bass solo, and you know it was no. I mean, when you say that to a bassist, they're not going to say no generally. <laughs> but if it was like you know or you know and fill this spot, and uh, the first show we did, uh, Clark Summers was playing bass. Who obviously, you know, was uh, part of the, you know, a team player, you know, the ultimate team player. Yeah. And we had Kevin Fort on piano mm -hmm. and Kevin pretty knocked it out. I sent him the recordings yeah. and anything that I didn't, you know, and I was writing out charts, you know, again, again, yeah, I'm the chart writer and some arranging. We all did some arranging on it too. Yeah. You know, I pretty much said, this is what I got. You know, his are a lot better than mine. I might be an outline of a chord, sent it to him. He listened to the recordings, you know, and then he, he sent back the, like, what was good. 
he put a little gold star and what was bad, he, you know, he sent it to me. And then uh, in the second concert, uh, we were joined with my, uh, with Corey Biggerstaff on bass. Yeah. And we, we play together all the time, uh, playing with Jeannie Tanner and a whole bunch, and sometimes with Michelle. And, yeah. and we were in the car and I was like, you know, you know anything about that stuff? You know, I, I didn't, I, I was giving him the gig before. And he was like, oh yeah, man, I used to listen to that stuff all the time. That's how I learned to play bass. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's weird. So we, fortuitous. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we, uh, that's how it all kind of came like, together. I went to that end too. I guess I, I didn't even mention how Alyssa and Jeff came onto it. I don't, I'll be honest with you. I, I probably was just following intuition. I had just been maybe talking to them around that time. And I just had a feeling, I was like, who do I think will possibly nerd out on this music? Who do I think <laughs> if I call them and they're just like, yeah, I have not done this before, but I'm all in. I will yeah. jump all in. And I called both of them and that's exactly what they did. They were just like, absolutely <laughs> count me in. <laughs> well, that, 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 that comes back to a question that I'm curious, Michelle, that you can answer. And I'm sure this pertains to Alyssa and Jeff too, but since they're not here to ask them, I'm asking you, but what did you learn when you were, you know, learning this music? What, what jumped out at you that you, you know, maybe now you use it in your in your repertoire when you're performing, because, you know, when you start transcribing and really getting inside of regardless of what who the artist is, you always find little nuances and find little things that help you. And especially as a vocalist, you probably found some things in this music that you you know you might have heard it a million times, but you never caught that because you were studying it so closely. Anything sure. jump out? Oh, wow. Um, no, that's a really good question. I, I guess the first thing that kind of comes to mind is just um, an idea of just how to work with vocalese, like listening to instrumental um, pieces with new ears. Mm. Um, and that was one of the things that I, I so appreciated about John Hendricks, because if you can just imagine, just like taking an instrumental piece and, and this is not, you're not writing words first, you're listening to what a, a composed through um, piece, you're listening to an improvised solo that was spontaneous and you're literally taking every note of that and making a decision about i'm not only am i going to write just some lyrics with john hendrix so expert he's going to write like a, 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 a stream of consciousness like through it's going to make sense yeah through this thing that's there so there was just so much to see about that just the uh genius of that um, um and learning lyrics to these pieces but also um having an opportunity to just um really uh, digest uh, Miles Davis, Count Basie, digest them in a whole new way yeah. with this like thought pattern, not only of just phrasing and lines and everything, but it's just like, why, why did John pick that lyric to go with that particular phrase? Like how did, why did that work? How like that got expressed a certain way. Um, so I just think I can speak for myself, but I think for all of us, it's, it, it just, it really informs you more as a jazz vocalist. Um, you get deeper into so many, so many, so much more layers of the music in terms of how you're expressing yourself. Have you, have you ever done vocalese yourself? I mean, do you, do you do that on, on some tunes? I mean, where you, cause he's improvising lyrics and he's, he's like, I mean, it's, it's like, Essentially, so the people that are watching this that don't understand, and I don't know why a drummer is about to explain this. I should just have Michelle explain. It. But <laughs> I'm going to try, and then you can you can fix it. But All right. um, but you know, essentially vocalese. I mean, you're essentially let's call it taking a sax solo, but you're vocalizing it, and you're putting lyrics instead of just scatting. You're actually creating a story by saying lyrics to it, so it it yeah. flows through. I mean, and and. John Hendricks specifically has influenced so many different vocalists. One of them, Kurt Elling, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with this style of music and with this style of vocalese. So have you done this in the past? I mean, because uh, it, it's incredibly difficult, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely have practiced it and brought it into pieces that I've done. I can't say that I've gone as far as to tra transcribe and write lyrics over a uh, improvised solo as of yet, though I'm still working at it. <laughs> but um, but definitely, I mean, there's a tradition um, and, and vocal jazz of, of writing lyrics to to the heads of tunes. Um, and, and I've definitely participated in that. Uh, both uh, I and Alyssa have done that, um, written our own original lyrics to the heads of, uh, uh, of tunes that we um, have been inspired by. 
and um, and that in and of itself is is, is difficult. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's still difficult. And, you, and you've done that to like like two or three Wayne Shorter yeah, tunes, right? I've done that to yeah. a few uh, Wayne Shorter tunes, to a Hal Galper tune. That's great. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what might be coming up on the next album too, but yeah. um, but yeah, I continue to to practice it. It's 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 a very special and specific type of songwriting and lyric writing that goes with that. That that is really not taught anywhere and the last person to teach it was john hendrix <laughs> at the university of toledo yeah. so um <laughs> right. I, I hope that someone like gets into that like that type of songwriting again well it's that. really it's really difficult i couldn't even imagine how you'd even approach teaching it like in a educational standpoint you know i mean right I mean, right i can see maybe one-on-one -on -one if you've got a private student and you guys are working on something and you're making suggestions but to be able to bring that into a curriculum like at a jazz studies level i don't even know how you would do that uh, because everybody's right. so different no you know yeah you know so i, all right, I so, sat in on one of those john Hendricks classes honestly <laughs> you, you know one thing that was interesting about that though you were talking about the, the, the group of the of the instrumentalist the other thing about the vocalist that i noticed as a you know drummer and instrumentalist is um what was interesting is is Alyssa. Michelle and especially Jeff uh, were able to make to kind of come together and not sound like and this is no slam in a New York voices kinds of thing or uh, what's the other uh, you know those, transfer those kind of, or yeah Manhattan transfer that I mean again this is their thing is high powered you know like you know voices of the angels kind of thing they're always kind of sing it but Michelle uh, Alyssa and Jeff brought that a little bit more into the kind of horn style phrasing or it doesn't always have to be and jeff being also a fine trumpet player yeah. i was noticing him a lot of times shaping a phrase that didn't sound like a singer was shaping a phrase but how he would be playing if he was playing second or if he was having a good day first chair and you know in a big band yeah. uh you know so it was interesting to hear how that kind of shaped that yeah and then after i was hearing your scatting you know after we, after she had been kind of she went to the well, she didn't go to the physical school of uh, John Hendricks, but she definitely went to the, the uh, musical one, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> I started hearing your scatting change quite a bit. Yeah, you know, and it it's just did. a little more paced. Uh, it's not kind of like you're revving up while the, you know, the the guitar player is doing his solo. You were you just have a lot more pacing and a lot more depth to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and that's that that to me would be the natural um, progression, right? Because when you it's like transcribing a solo, you hear the space. Or you hear the different phrasing differently when you're really getting into it rather than just listening to it in the car. So, I mean, to get into that depth and it's surprising how much depth there is because he used to make it sound so simple. Like it was like, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. You know, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah right. listening to like Ella Fitzgerald sketch. It's like, oh, yeah, no problem. What's the big yeah. deal? Hey, what's the I problem? I could probably do that. <laughs> But that, that was the okay. that was the beauty of that group is they made everything sound so simple, but it was so complex. So yeah. it could connect with that audience. So we should tell everybody they need to head over to Facebook.com slash Michelle Thomas Music at 730 tonight and talk a little bit about the format. Now, you guys are going to be doing a, a an interview back and forth with Alyssa and Jeff while playing some of the tunes back and forth. Right. So this is going to be kind of an exciting, uh, exciting show that hopefully your technology is a little better than mine. That's the that's the thought process. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to pull together uh, quite a few. We're trying to we're gonna try, try to eclipse you actually tonight. So <laughs> what we're doing is we're playing the show. Uh, we're also gonna bring uh, Alyssa and Jeff in for some interview stuff and just talking about well that show, yeah, uh, current events. Uh, you know, uh, all these different kinds of things, what we were doing through the shutdown. So I'm yeah. stealing a little bit of your thunder, but we are also I wanted to mention uh, also. We have. I, I used to carry around a camera and shoot every show Michelle does, and I was usually just testing a camera. Yeah. So anyway, we had all this footage from Winters, and uh, we were, you know, we've done a couple other live streams from different clubs, and we were putting this up, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, we got this notice uh, on Facebook that a lot of the jazz community got that uh, Scott had put up, or with the, you know, help of some other musicians, put up a fundraiser for Winters Jazz Club. Uh, you know, uh, just to survive COVID, I guess, I think it was called anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking through all this footage, you know, in Final Cut Pro and I'm like, you know, we can't put this up and put our stupid, you know, tip jar up. You know what I mean? <laughs> and this is, I, I shot this all in that room. So you're like, you know what we need to, you know, right. And, we, yeah, and, and then you're, and, and you know, so that's part of it. So we're yeah. also going to tie that in, 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 in oh. uh, try to get a little more money to, 
make sure all these places stay open because oh, if they, you know, great. <laughs> we're going to come back. I don't want to come back to empty rooms, right? No, yeah, <laughs> and that's that's part of the that's part of the problem, right? I mean, Andy's. I, I know Andy's has a GoFundMe page going because I mean they're they're going to struggle to reopen. I know Dave Gemolo up at the Green Mill just you know did his his uh, yeah. live concert outside and he was uh, selling some back uh, well alcohol and things like that to go yeah. out of there. But I mean. You know, to be able to reopen. Yeah, Andy's, I, I was just, I think I was just booked on one coming up. I guess they're going to be no, no crowd doing, so. they already did one. Um, and they're going to, yeah, do no crowd concerts in there where nobody's going to be in there and yeah. be broadcasting live streaming. So, yeah. and I'm, already, I'm on the one uh, a week from Monday, I think, mm -hmm. with Jeannie Tanner, I think. Yeah. But anyway, that's what, yeah. Well, it's going to be I difficult. It's going to be difficult. I mean, <clears throat> talking to a lot of the different venue owners and stuff, I mean, this, this is a brand new way of operating and trying to trying to find your way through. And unlike unlike restaurants and bars, not that they're doing great by any means, but at least there's some sort of business model where they can sit outside and have drinks and food and come back in with with especially a lot of these performance venues, such as especially Winters, but also Andy's. I mean, you know, when you get limited to a, a small amount of people and you whole your whole business is live performance and packing them in. It's going to be really tough for everybody to uh, to try to maneuver around this whole thing, which is going to be going on for a while. So I'm glad right. they're 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 figuring things out. But you know, congratulations to you guys for actually putting a little tip jar out and helping Scott because I mean, you know, that's that's one of those things that I know he put that GoFundMe up to get things going. Plus, he had some health issues, so you know, just yeah. a super yeah. guy, and we we want him to come out of this whole situation as best as possible. Yeah much as we're able to kind of connect to each other and help each other. I mean, we're, we are the community there. So that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. So outside of that, uh, quick okay. question, what else do you guys got coming up now? Darren and Michelle, you also have your drink and a wink. So we should, we got to plug that. <laughs> How are you going to get any okay. sponsorships if you don't do that? Come yes. On, let's go. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Darren. Oh, okay. Well, as this is the brainchild of Darren. Okay. So in addition to drumming and writing charts, uh, a few years ago, I, I, I came up with this thing for what was called drinking a wink. And really all it was, was I was getting a fascination with whiskey and I was in the middle of some like really loud bar. I wasn't playing a jazz gig. I was playing some rock gig and he's doing the, you know, uh, uh, you know, shots and I'm going crazy. And I sat by, you know, behind my drums. I just held the phone. I just did this thing where I went drunk, put it down, did a little wink and just sent it out to the world. And, uh, <laughs> That has gone on, and it kind of caught on. And I, I brought in a bunch of musicians on that one. So, like, Elaine Dame did one with me, Jake Vinsel, Corey Biggerstaff, Jeannie Tanner, blah, 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 Rose Colella, Alyssa and Jeff, Michelle. And then after a while, I started, like, we were on gigs, and I was talking to people, uh, you know, that I was starting to give them, like, you know, advice on whiskey and stuff. So I created a Facebook page. It's called Drink and a Wink. <laughs> and uh, a Facebook group, I should say. And uh, we are we went from you know me and then my my you know my fake Facebook account to now we're, we're almost ready to get over a hundred members. It's mostly Chicago musicians and and kind of related to that. It's a lot of fun, and you know I've had some downtime right like all of us. So it's been a little fun to get over there and have a second thing to do. So. <laughs> I love it, man. And and you know you do some reviews, so everybody who loves whiskey, uh, they've got to check it out. They've got to head over drinking a wink Facebook dot com. Yeah. That's There's no snobbiness over there. I don't know a whole, a whole lot. I'm just telling you, you know, maybe I can save you a few bucks of buying bad stuff and, you know, encourage you to buy some good stuff. So come well, on over. I, I think I think a lot of people don't know what to buy. So right. you're, you're actually you're actually an essential worker. That's the way. Yeah, you know what? That's it. the way I like to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I try it. to keep it. I mean, again, people people are sometimes like, you know. Uh, how do you have all that? Well, I had a little help with it, but you keep in mind, I'm a musician. I'm not an investment banker or I don't know. I don't know what career is solvent right now. I'm none of those. I'm a musician. So I try to put those things out there that, you know, here's some things that are a certain price. Here's the good ones at that price. Here's the ones that you can stay away from. So yeah. I'm just helping out. So yeah, I'm essential. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're an essential worker. You are just here to help. And that's all you can do. You can just help people. Right. <laughs> One sip at a time and a wink. Right. <laughs> All 
All right. So, oh, Tracy Oliver just commented survival information. See, that's a good point. See, one, our, one of our <laughs> watchers. Right, it's right. survival information. See, very good. Excellent. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to let you guys go. We're going to we're going to link things up here um, so that everybody can go check it out. 730 tonight. Michelle Thomas music on Facebook. It's going to be great live stream. Um, the show that was at Winters last year. A lot of interviews, a lot of uh, unexpected banter, I'm sure, will be ensuing over there. And, uh, of course, all the tips and all the proceeds that they collect are going to go to help Scott over at Winters. And, uh, you know, let's get everything back open and let's get everybody back up and running. And hopefully we'll be able to all see a live performance together in Chicago very soon. Yeah. And Mike, I just want to thank you for what you're even doing right now, because you're you're keeping the music going, keeping the spotlight on the artists and the musicians, and 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 making sure that we're not forgotten during this time, and and um, and giving people something to look forward to. And wow. and yeah, it just it's just like the drinking a wink thing for me. The best thing about being a musician is obviously playing music. The second is the hang. That's and right. that's the thing that we're all missing right now. It's so really this true. feels like a hang. Yeah. It's great. You know? Yeah, it feels like a hang. And I had technical difficulties at the beginning. It's almost like <laughs> right. I tripped over a table, right? As I said, totally. that was perfect. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> all right. Well, congrats, <laughs> congratulations to you guys. And always great to hang with you and see you guys. And I'm sure I'll talk to you guys soon. And uh, have a good stream tonight. Sounds Thanks good. so Thank much. You. All right. Take see care. you later. All right. All right, Michelle and Darren, you know, you've got to head over. You've got to check that out. That's going to be fun hang, as they said. And, um, you know, it's an incredible show. So you get a chance, head over to see that stream 730 tonight. We'll link that up right after this show ends. But right now we've got another guest. I'm going to I'm going to bring up Bill Chape and we're going to dial him up here on Skype and hopefully everything works smoothly as it should, I hope on our system here because it was it's not uh running smoothly on friday but hopefully it's moved right there and uh let me bring him up and there's bill hey bill how are you hey mike i'm good how are you today i'm i'm doing good i'm glad look at that man that was a smooth transition we were able to do it that it Woo. looks like you can hear me i can hear you and i'm seeing you so that's that's the entire battle on my end so man i'm glad we could i'm glad we could touch base today i'm glad we could bring you on the show because you and I first connected about the uh, the Grays Lake Summer Jazz Camp that uh, you were you were you've been doing for quite a while, and we were we were helping to promote a little bit in the spring, and of course COVID nineteen happened and kind of put all summer jazz camps and all educational things in general on hold or at least online and on live stream, and then you know you and I emailed back and forth, and I thought it'd be great to bring you on because. You know, outside of the fact that you're an educator, you're also obviously a working musician and recording artist. And, you know, you do corporate events, you do corporate performances. You also do club gigs and live performances and festivals and everything else. So I, I thought I would bring you on. And the first question I'd love to pick your brain a little bit about is um, how are you holding up during this wonderful COVID-19 situation, an unprecedented time in musical history? Well, um, I, I'm doing fine, certainly. I, I can't complain. Personally, uh, we uh, we lost our gigs, but uh, I've been able to do some some streaming and stay in touch with a few musicians through it. Uh, certainly, resonate with your uh, uh, battles with technology. I've I've been it's been a steep learning curve, and I've been trying to combine a few things, but. Uh, uh, happily, the students and and uh, I have a number of students that are you know middle school, high school age, and they've been grateful to still be able to continue their lessons. And of course, this technology has allowed it. Uh, and then my adult students have enjoyed it too. They some of them have a little bit more time to work on stuff, and and uh, so that part's been good. Uh, it it has been um, hard not seeing the musicians that I was working with every week, and and uh, I. Um, personally haven't had to depend on music for my whole, uh, you know, way, um, uh, means of living, but I, you know, have great compassion for those who do. And of course I know some of those folks and, and, uh, wishing, wish, wishing we could get back to it, especially for their benefit. Oh yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, and, and I just had Michelle and, uh, Darren on, and we were talking about their live stream that they had recorded at, uh, Winter's Jazz Club last year. And they're restreaming it and all that stuff. Um, you know, it's interesting you brought up the technology part of it because I think, and and uh, you know, for those of you that have watched this show 
that are, that are watching right now, you're going to hear the same thing that I've been saying. But I'm I'm curious to get your take, Bill, on the whole situation. Is that, you know, I think this big pause. One, if there's a silver lining to come out of it at all, I think it's causing a lot of the musicians that are used to running from gig to gig to lesson to lesson and doing that, and then the next day happens, and the next day happens, and the next day happens, and it keeps going. It's kind of made everybody stop and figure out technology a little bit and and figure out a way to still make music, teach, generate some sort of revenue online. And I'm curious to get your take because, you know, as an educator, you're you're teaching all all ages of musicians with private lessons. Um, how's it been for you to connect with the student? Are you finding like, you know, there might be some students that maybe you have a lesson with in person once a month instead of every week, because it's just easier sometimes from a scheduling standpoint to do the zoom thing. And then when you can actually get together, you guys get together. I mean, how's that working out? Well, for me, the uh, lesson structure and schedule has, has stayed pretty much the same. Uh, it was interesting the week that, that schools shut down and I knew that I couldn't uh, have students in person uh, Jazz Education Network did a couple of webinars on teaching online, and uh, um, <clears throat> I was amazed at, uh, I, I ended my career in education as a technology director, and so I was in charge of technology for a school, but it's been about 10 years now, but I can see the progress of technology over those times and how ready many schools, not all schools, but how ready many schools and uh you know, there are certainly places that, you know, homes that don't have technology, but uh, to the degree that they do, we were we were ready to continue and jump right into it. You know, yeah. the only thing is, and they warned us about that in this uh, Jazz Education Network uh, webinar, you can't have the same expectations because you really can't hear tone and you can't mm -hmm. hear things precisely. So... I've had to change my expectations and I've talked with other teachers that have had to do the same. It, it's a new ball game. It's, it's more frustrating. You, you can't, you can't do what you could before, but that was their advice at Jen is lower your expectations a little bit, be patient. And with that, with that attitude, um, I've really been enjoying working with students, even, even with the technological barriers. Um, do, do you think you're, do you think you're, I mean, you'll probably go back to in-person lessons when you possibly can, but I mean, that might be something where you're, you know, you might, you might end up taking up some students that find you online through some of your other uh, streams and some of your other things, and you'd be able to connect with them and build out a, a, an entire student base that's outside of the Chicago area that you probably would have never even thought to even think about before all of this happened. Oh, definitely. Well, and this whole thing has made, I think you, you were referencing it earlier, it's made, I think all of us do a, a steep learning curve on a bunch of technologies. Um, I, on my um, <clears throat> teaching, of course, it's been, oh, how do, you, how do you manage the specific settings of, say, Zoom, yeah. and both on the, on, on the student's perspective and on your own, and then starting, you know, I just thought, why, why not try a couple of live feeds? And and then I'm into streaming software, and <laughs> and then I'm into oh, uh, you know, not a great enough frame rate to keep my uh, my um, you know stream going, and and researching that, and I've uh, been doing a lot more with Logic because in my live feeds I've actually <clears throat> sent backing tracks to other musicians. They've recorded their piece, and then I've pulled it back in, and then I I play play the backing. Uh, and their performance live while I'll play the piano behind them. And so okay. to get all of that done within, and then also an interview within within a stream, obviously you know all about that. But, yeah. um, you know, so I, yeah, uh, my son is a is a sound technician at the Goodman Theater, so he's been a great resource oh, for man, me. Oh, that, man, that's the guy to know, huh? <laughs> yeah, boy, he's been helpful. <laughs> well, th let's talk a little bit about your career, too, because, you know, we should tell everybody to go over to buildshapen.com. And build and jazz I've got it sitting right in front of me and I didn't say it. So yes, build shape and jazz.com. And we guys send over, everybody should go over there because then you can get the full update. If you, maybe you want to inquire about taking some lessons with bill, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about that. But also uh, when he does live streams and everything, you can get all the information and get updated on that. 
Um, talk a little bit about how you got interested in piano. Now you were you were doing technology for 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 schools, so you were a, a technology person in schools, but you also did education. You were also in the music field too, right? Well, my uh, I've kind of had a, a a double double life for a number of years. I was actually an English teacher first, and then moved into technology, and that's where I spent my career as an educator. But um, I uh, <clears throat> I had a a wedding band for many years with my wife sang in and uh, a couple of other guys that I met through the College of Lake County jazz band uh, played in it, uh, great players. And we had a, a working band for about 15 years. And um, and <clears throat> then I, I got a chance to teach uh, jazz piano out at the College of Lake County. Um, and then uh, eventually I uh, let that go. I was busy with my tech job. And so I've been uh, teaching privately ever since. And so um, I uh, um, have always done music on the side until most recently. Now it's <laughs> it's more full time, uh, and I've really enjoyed in my post official education life both teaching and and playing, and had a great opportunity to play at uh, you know some area restaurants a lot, as well as the College of Lake County Band, which is a great jazz band, just with some really heavy players, a great great directors uh, that we've had over over the years. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know, I know, um, I know that band and I know that, that college and I know that there's some, some great players that come out of that. I think, I think Chris White used to teach up there, if I'm not mistaken, like years ago, I think he used to teach when he first came back, when he first came to Chicago, I can remember him doing that when we were playing gigs and he was astonished at the program that was set up up there. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's really, uh, there's so many good programs and jazz education programs around the Chicagoland area that people, you know, aren't even aware of because you only hear of a couple downtown Chicago here and there. But I mean, there, there really are. Talk a little bit about the difference between teaching music and teaching technology. I mean, that's that it's different, but I got to imagine there's there's a lot of similarities as well. Yes, I I certainly uh, uh, there. There's a great, great blend between um uh, teaching, I think, teaching any subject. Um, the, one of the the differences, though, when you're teaching something like, especially if you're teaching jazz and improvisation, you know, there's a different approach. It's, uh, you know, kind of how do you how do you teach people to make things up? <clears throat> and I can connect it most to uh, teaching speech. I had I did some introductory speech classes when I was an English teacher, and then you're helping students develop articulation to be able to have a topic and say something coherent about it. And, you know, creating a good jazz solo, I'd say, would be similar. You know, it's how do I get myself at the point where I'm fluent enough with the chords and the changes to, OK, now make something up and maybe even respond to the other band members while I do it. So right. so I that's that's the um, I guess that's the remaining challenge that I think will keep me um fascinated the rest of my life, you know, is how to effectively teach improvisation and as well as just the uh, subject of jazz piano. So that's one of the, that to me is one of the most difficult things. And I, I'm, I know a lot of people that are watching this, uh, love music, love jazz, love all different genres, and they hear people perform. And from my standpoint, I learned I learned very technically at first on, on the drums and even playing marimba and all of that stuff. My biggest challenge was being able to actually feel comfortable, confident, loose, and stay in time when I was improvising because it just wasn't taught in school. It wasn't taught to me and I, as I came through because especially with the way education goes, um, it's, it's very simple, especially coming up, as you know, uh, to sit there and go through, all right, go through page one, go through page two, here's how you count, here's your 16th notes, count this way, count that way. All right. Now. And then all of a sudden you do that for like three years and you can read music and you do it. OK, now play a solo. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? So I, it's interesting. Oh, and yeah. I mean, how do you approach that when you get like a beginning student, even if they're like, you know, an older student? I mean, it's got to be something that's it's it's probably easier for younger students to be able to even conceptualize improvisation because they don't have all these guardrails put up compared to like an older student. Oh, I, I have great compassion for my adult adults because they come in already having accomplished so much in their life. And if you're going to learn something new, you have to be childlike. You don't mm -hmm. have to return to that place. 
So a lot, a lot of what I do with with students is breaking things down. I mean, with piano, as as with percussion, it's a multi-limbed operation yep. and multi-digits in the case of piano. So if you think about the, uh, I, I talk to students a lot about how much RAM they have. You know, how how much headspace is there in your brain yeah. to manage both of your hands, your left hand doing maybe a voicing, your right hand soloing, and then oh yeah, I got to keep track of time too. So all <laughs> yeah. of those components are out there, and and you know I, I think a lot about how my own skills have developed over time, and and actually right as I was retiring from Warren Township High School where I spent my career, I went back and studied with Jim Trompeter, oh, and yeah, wow. he he just took me you know he he just put me down to base metal and started over with me, but he was just always talking about time and feel. And I mean, I'm still, I'm, I'm, well, you know, it's a work in progress, the whole thing always. But so I try to keep that in mind when I'm working with students. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. Young, young people tend to have uh, just a little bit more ability to just jump right in and make it happen. But, but, but uh, we older people can still learn too. Sure, sure. Well, I I saw in your bio that you attended a Jamie Abersall camp, and I I went to uh, the Abersall camp when I was twenty, when it was still at Elmhurst College, and I went there, and <clears throat> I had gone through all of this stuff. I had started at Oakton Community College when I was in high school. I was with Jake Jerger, and we played in Carnegie Hall. I've done all this stuff, and then I went to the Abersall camp, and I'll never forget it, man. It's when I met Ed Soap, and I met Jeff. Uh, Dan Hurley and everybody, which I ended up studying with when I was at North Texas and all that. But I met all these guys and Jamie Aversall like stops the entire band one night when I'm trying to play. Cause I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know about improvisation. And he yells at me for playing four on the floor, four bass drums on the floor and told me to take a solo. And I'm like, I don't even know how to do that, man. <laughs> and he's like, all right, start over. And to your point, Ed broke me completely down and started bringing it back up. I had to relearn how to play conceptual wise because I could read, I could do all this, but I just had to relearn and kind of think differently about music in general. It sounds like that's what Trumpeter did. He kind of just was like, all right, wait, let's, let's start from the beginning and re reboot. And sometimes that's the best medicine for somebody to get to that next level. Yeah. Well, and I, I knew I needed it. I'd spend a lot of years playing, you know, top 40 stuff and always had the, uh, my first training in jazz was from Alan Swain. I'm mm -hmm, sure people sure. know his name, yeah. you know, and, but I did that. And then I started having kids and got busy in my career. And so, um, there were a lot of years in between for bad habits to form. <laughs> so he took care of that. <laughs> and I, I actually, you mentioned the Abersol thing. My first one, I went out to university of Northern Colorado because my brother-in-law lived out there and sister, and he's a jazz guitarist. And anyway, so I went out there and I think it was Mantooth who was the piano guy oh, yeah, sure. that week. Yeah. And they stuck me in a lab with three other people who had no experience. And our first year, I wasn't in a combo even. I just had to learn voicings and, and get started. But, yeah, it was a wonderful start. Yeah, yeah. And that and that camp, I mean, you know, when when I look back, I only went to one, but it changed my the entire way I thought about stuff. I quit taking lessons. I studied the stuff I got at the Abersall camp for eight months, went down, auditioned at North Texas, and – the rest is history. So, I mean, it, it really is one of those things that it's just like you never know when you're going to get inspired and hit and hear the right thing. And then, boom, you're off to the races, you know. So with you, you were doing corporate gigs. You were doing the wedding band stuff and everything else. Now you're teaching. Now you're, uh, you know, retired from technology teaching. Now you're in music education and teaching private lessons. But you also uh, run the Grays Lake Summer Jazz Camp when – it's able to actually happen. Did you start that yourself or did you to combine with some, some other people to do that? Um, well, I, I did start it myself, but uh, very soon thereafter, I've had people join me. I, I had a student whose father um, really wanted to, him to have a, a group experience. He's a very talented young man. And, and uh, uh, so uh, I had always thought about this Abersold model and and so I started it one summer and he was in it and it happened that my son was uh, um, gonna be a freshman that year. And he uh, 
um, was in the combo. And I just ran across the photos recently of the first first kids that were in the program <laughs> and posted them on my Facebook page. But but anyway, then the, the year after that, a guy named Paul Nielsen, who's a, a jazz, jazz and music educator in town here in Grays Lake, joined me. And he and I have done it forever since. And there were a couple of years where I didn't do it and he kept it going. And then since I uh, retired from uh, from my education job, uh, we've built it up a little bit more. And now we have three other teachers with it. So there are five faculty members now. So that, well, that's amazing because, I mean, you know, a lot of times they're connected to schools, but to be able to start this on kind of like a, a separate independent organization to do something like that, there's such a need for that um, in all the different areas. You know, obviously, I know Midwest at young artists really well. And I, I remember when they first got started up there and that that whole thing, giving kids the opportunity to learn outside of the normal classroom and the normal school with like professionals like yourself. That's one of those things that summer camps, summer jazz camps. I mean, you can go you can get eight months worth of information in like a week if you go to the right one. And then you've got to space them out. And there are not a lot of them around the Chicagoland area, especially in your area. I don't think there's any. Right. So, I mean, I'm glad that you guys are filling that need and actually actually able to connect with students. What's the response been? I mean, you probably have waiting lists now for people to come to the camp, I would imagine, because once the word gets out that so-and-so can really play after they went to this camp that uh, Bill's running. I'm sure you started getting inquiries. Well, our first year we had one combo of eight students and then it grew to two or three combos a summer for many years. But uh, I can't say we've had a waiting list because we've just, um, you know, everybody, we actually run it once a week for five weeks plus some performances mm -hmm. opportunities. And so we've been able to schedule it so that, uh, um, one instructor can do two or three combos, usually two. And so we've just been bringing more people on as the interest has grown. So we, we haven't had to turn anyone down yet. And that, uh, but yeah, it's been, had a, we've had a great response. And of course, the, the unique thing about it or the unique service that it's offering is time to focus on improvisation. Because even uh, and not not uh, denigrating the efforts of schools and, and the band programs, but when you have a large band and even some combos, the amount of time to be able to do the experimenting you need to really learn how to become fluent as an improviser, it just isn't there. You know, to, to anyway, the it may may be there, but some are don't hurt on top of it. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's it's you offer a more focused and concise way of learning that stuff. I mean, to try to learn improvisation and for a band director who's got 20 other people running around and having yeah. to worry about everything else, it's just a whole different ball game. And the students are really, when you get to be a, an improviser, as you know, like I'm telling you something, but I'm telling everybody else something, you know, it, you really need to free your mind up and you need to be able to think and organize and just relax I, to, to be able to teach properly in a like a high school or junior high environment like hardcore improvisation over jazz tunes specifically i mean that it's just a tall order so to have yeah. organizations like what you have and what some of these other schools have outside of the regular educational thing i think that's why a lot of the students really excel because you've got a lot of like-minded students that want to get better and then they're in the right incubator and it and it and it takes off so you must see a lot of students that come in at the beginning of the five weeks and then they leave and you're like, whoa, that, that, that they really got something out of this. Oh yeah. Some of them really, uh, really become very fluent improvisers. And uh, yeah, we've had a number of students who over there, uh, some start in middle school and go through high school. And uh, I actually do a jam session once a month too. And, and some of, some of those students come, come to that. And uh, we've actually continued that during the, during the uh, social distancing where we're not attempting to play at the same time, but we've been trading 12s, oh, you know, yeah. maybe a blues tune or trading fours. And there's a little bit of time in between, but at least we're getting together. But these, these people that come every month um, are just really just so comfortable. They, they know how to conduct themselves on the bandstand and it's, it's really uh, just a joy to see. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that's awesome. And congratulations on that. I'm sorry it's on hold this year, but 2021, be back in business. And uh, 
Bill, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, and we'll send everybody over to BillChapinJazz.com to find out the stream. When's the next live stream that you're going to be doing? Uh, it's this Friday. Okay. Uh, have Joe, Joe Odd is my guest artist. He's a fantastic um, tenor sax player. And uh, we we actually tried last week, and I, uh, I I actually got a new computer in the midst of this, and just everything conspired against me. And <laughs> so I, I got to a tune, and no one could hear me. So so we're gonna <laughs> gonna reprise it this week. All right. So so what time? Uh, Friday at noon. Uh, Friday Friday noon mini concerts. Ah, just okay. Just a couple right. of tunes. I love it. Yeah. Noon noon on Friday. So check out BillChapinJazz.com to find out how to watch that and see that, and of course connect with Bill if you're interested and taking some lessons uh, virtually right now, potentially in person later. Bill, it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks for jumping on today. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, reconnecting with you live and in person sometime soon. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Bye now. All right. We had a full jam-packed show today. Michelle and Darren. Bill, I mean, great stories, great information. Hopefully we're connecting everybody here in the Chicago Music scene, among other places around the world. I want to thank all of you for watching. Uh, tomorrow, we've had a little bit of a conflict, so we're going to see. We might not have a show tomorrow. I'm, I'm waiting to find out uh, how we're going to do that. I've got some scheduling conflicts on my end, so stay tuned. We'll be announcing that in the morning, and if we don't have a show tomorrow, we are definitely going to have a show on Thursday, so stand by for all of those announcements. This week has just been sort of in flux for my schedule, and I apologize, but hey, I thank everyone for watching. Of course, as I always say, if you like this show, please share it. Please like it. Please say hi. Let us know you're out there. Give us a heads up if we should be covering an event coming up soon. As I always say, if you like this show, please tell your friends, tell your neighbors, call the grandkids tomorrow, potentially. Well, actually, check in tomorrow to find out if we're doing a show tomorrow because I've got a conflict that we're trying to work around, so we'll see what happens. Otherwise, I will see you back here at Thursday, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you then.